Let's now transition from thinking about exchange rates in the long run to thinking about them in the short run. So really uh, what we've learned so far, among other things, is the general pull towards the real exchange rate equaling one. talked about how this might occur for individual goods. In that regard, we discussed the law of one price. And then we thought about real exchange rates for a basket of goods, the cost of living and how that would generally trend towards one. So in the long run, you can think of it this way. You know, if right now the real exchange rate is three between us and Spain for some particular item, if you had to guess 30 years from now, uh, that's probably going to trend in the downward direction and, you know, get closer to one. It's unlikely it'll ever get to one because of transaction costs, but it will probably trend in that direction as transaction costs reduce. However, in the short run, the law of one price, purchasing power parity, these things, they don't really matter in the short run. In the short run, there are lots of factors that can play into the prices that occur across the world. Um, so we need to think about the drivers of exchange rates. And we can think about this both in terms of nominal exchange rates, right? That's just the exchange rate of currency. And also we can think about it in terms of the real exchange rate, which is thinking about the price of goods once you exchange money. Um, and really, you can think of it as a market. So let me give you just a nice, simple example to begin with. We'll call this example one, and then we'll formalize it. Let's think about the market for US dollars relative to euros. So whenever you exchange euros for dollars, you know, you can kind of imagine you're over in Germany and you're moving to the US, so you're exchanging euros for dollars. What you're really doing there is you're buying dollars with euros, okay? So we can think of it as a market where there is a price and there is a quantity. Now, we could leave it this way, and this is a fine way to do the graph, but to make things a little more informative so that we understand what we're talking about here, rather than say price, we're going to say euros per dollar. So it's the price of dollars specifically relative to euros. If we change this to pesos, then you're going to have a completely different market. So when you think about markets, you need to recognize that the exchange rate between two currencies is its own unique market. And it doesn't necessarily show us what's happening in other exchange markets, okay? So this is euros per dollar. And down here, the quantity is the quantity of dollars exchanged in this market. I'm not always gonna write all this out, but I'm gonna do it now. Um, just to hopefully reduce the odds of some confusion. So you might be tempted to say, if I just put quantity of dollars to think, well, this is all the dollars that exist, or maybe the quantity of dollars is all the money exchanged. No, this is specifically the quantity of dollars exchanged in the euros for dollars market, okay? So if you bought a coffee downtown today, it's not in this market. If you exchange currency for Mexican pesos, it's not in this market, okay? This is a very specific market. This is the market for dollars, but only the market for dollars relative to euros. So we can kind of think about why this would change and why the graphs would look this way. Um, let's start with the supply curve. Let's think about what causes it to be upward sloping, right? So upward sloping could be steep, could be flat. That has to do with uh, elasticity. We're not gonna worry about that. We know it's upward sloping. And here's the logic for this, okay? The logic for this is if the value of dollars appreciates relative to euros, think about what that means. Okay, that, that's really saying the price goes up. If the value of dollars goes up, that means the price of dollars, right? The number of euros you need to buy a dollar goes up. Think about what that would mean, all right? Um, Imagine you're in the United States and you've got US dollars that are appreciating relative to euros. And we're holding all else constant here, right? Just like we normally do in economics. Ceteris paribus, imagine if US dollars went up in value. 
What that means is, if you have $100 right now in your wallet, that $100 could buy more stuff in the Eurozone than it could yesterday. So that means you're more likely to exchange it in order to buy European goods or to invest in European investments, okay? So if the value of dollars appreciate relative to euros, Americans and anyone else with US dollars will supply more dollars in this market. All right, and this, this nomenclature we use here is a little bit confusing because you know we're normally thinking about goods and services when we use supply and demand. But what we're saying here is the supplier of dollars, these are people who have dollars. They could take those dollars and buy stuff with it, right? They could buy euros with it, okay? What we're saying here is if the US dollar goes up in value, people will sell more dollars. Selling dollars means buying stuff. It means, in this case, buying euros. So if the US dollar appreciates, Americans supply more US dollars by exchanging for euros. Okay? Now to be clear, if you're a consumer, you might not think of it this way, right? But let, let's say that you buy some a really nice um, Italian suit, okay? If you're buying a nice Italian suit, you're not thinking to yourself that you need to exchange the currency first, but it does happen. It's the businesses that facilitate those exchanges, okay? But if you buy an Italian suit, right, that US dollar that you use first gets converted into euros and then facilitates that purchase, okay? So as we buy more European goods, there's gonna be an increase in the supply of funds, the supply of US dollars that get exchanged for euros. So that is why you get that upward sloping curve. The more the US dollar appreciates, the more the US dollars will be sold to buy um, uh, European dollars, Euro European uh, euros, I should say, okay? On the other side of the market is demand. All right, now think about this. Supply is the people that have something to sell. They have the dollars. Demand is the people who don't have that thing, so they wanna buy it. So these are generally going to be European people that we're talking about here in this specific example, okay? So what this tells you is if the value of dollars depreciates, if the value of dollars depreciates, that means, <coughs> excuse me, the value of euros appreciates, okay? So you, you kind of have to recognize here that supply and demand are kind of telling you the same thing just from opposite angles, okay? Supply is the people that have dollars that might want euros. Demand is the people who have euros that demand dollars, okay? So you just have the opposite effect here. So in this case, if the value of dollars depreciates, the value of euros appreciates, so, Primarily Europeans or anyone else that have euros will demand more U.S. dollars because U.S. dollars are right now easy to get, right? If you're somebody in Germany and you're thinking about um, investing, right, what you might recognize is if your euros are gaining value relative to U.S. dollars, then what that means is if you want to invest in the American stock market, your currency goes further than it used to. So you are more likely to exchange to get US dollars so that you can buy the S&P 500 index fund, for example, okay? So that explains why this is downward sloping. As the US dollar depreciates, the Euro appreciates, causing more people to take advantage of that in the Eurozone by exchanging their Euros for dollars. They're gonna get a big bang for their buck, right? Every Euro is gonna get them more dollars than it used to. So they're gonna do more of that to take advantage of the relatively cheap U.S. dollars to buy American goods, buy American investments, or whatever, okay? So that's the market for U.S. dollars relative to euros. This market can shift. Um, let me go ahead and give you an example of why this might shift. And what we'll see a lot of times is when we draw these graphs is we're going to draw two at a time. So now let's do two markets. I'm going to leave this one up here. We'll stick with this uh, 
US Euro example. But I'm going to draw now the comparison graph. If there is a market for dollars relative to euros, well, then there's also the opposite. So there are euros. And so down here, rather than the quantity of dollars exchanged, this is the quantity of euros exchanged for dollars. Okay? This is dollars per euro. And what we will learn is, if we draw these two graphs at the same time, they're going to be directly connected. Okay, these markets you see are the same market, just from a different perspective. If we think about the market for dollars relative to euros, well, the only way to get in and out of that market is to exchange dollars and euros, which is true in both of these markets, okay? So really, it's the same market, okay? The difference would be, um, in terms of the, uh, the way it looks, is you got to recognize that the quantity here is not necessarily the same. There's no reason it would be, okay? Um, if, for example, if the euro is worth twice as much as the dollar, then there's going to need to be twice as much quantity here than there is here, right? Just the quantities don't match because the value of the currencies are not the same. Same deal here. Euros per dollar, dollars per euro, those will be inverse values of one another. So these graphs are going to give us the same insights, but they do have different values, okay? So we can show the equilibrium. By the way, these are markets that do operate at equilibrium. It's much like uh, you know, the stock market. Very much perfect competition. Prices change consistently over time. There's one price everywhere. So it's absolutely a perfect market. So thinking about this example right here, let's say, just to give you a really simple, silly example here, that I take a vacation in Italy. Sounds good to me. I'm gonna go to Milan, go to Florence, gonna be a good time. Just imagining that this is big enough to affect the market, which it really isn't, but imagine if I do this, let's think about the little small effect it would have on these markets, all right? This is an exogenous shock, all right? For those of you who've heard that term before, you probably know what it means, but just in case, an exogenous shock means that no one could have anticipated it, all right? So this is just like when you get an unexpected change in the stock market or the Fed does something unexpectedly. When I vacation in Italy, no one really knows that's going to happen ahead of time, so they can't predict it, so this is going to shift the curves, okay? Specifically, what this does, when I go to Italy, I'm going to need to take my US dollars and exchange them for euros. So what that does is, is it increases the supply of dollars being exchanged, okay? And you can kind of think of supply shifting as the uh, what's initiating it here, okay? Supply is what's driving the change. I need to get rid of these dollars so that I can get the European currency. So supply increases on this side of the market, and conversely, for euros, the demand increases. And the result is that US dollars will depreciate. Okay? The quantity increases on this side of the market. Um, basically, what I'm saying here in this little miniature example, what I'm saying here is I don't need these dollars. I'm trying to get rid of these dollars. And when you try to get rid of something, it drives down the price. And that's what you're seeing right here. So if lots of people start moving to Italy, what you can expect to see is that the U.S. dollar is going to depreciate relative to the euro. On the other side of the market, you get the opposite effect. Remember, these are reciprocal values. So if this one goes down, this one over here has to go up. So since people really need euros in this case, right? I'm needing euros badly. I'm making it more scarce by taking them for myself. When you take something and you make it more scarce because you're, you're buying it or you're getting it, right? It makes it gain value. So the price here goes up. So what that means is you're going to get depreciation for dollars. You're going to get appreciation for euros. And in both cases, you see that the quantity goes up. More money is now going to be exchanged between these two markets, which is what you would expect to see, right? We've suddenly got someone else needing to exchange money, so you get an increase in quantity. So that's generally what we're talking about here. This is the... Uh, the type of relationships we're talking about here with supply and demand. Now let's get specific and think about all the different stuff that can affect these markets. We're deal still dealing with the uh, short run effects here. And now what I'd like to think about is the stuff 
that affects supply. We've kind of done this before. We talked about the things that would affect supply. So I've got a list here. This comes, by the way, straight out of the textbook. So if you have the textbook, this is a good time to use it. Um, but I'm just going to run through some of these things that affect supply. And the first basically is tastes. All right. Um, this is kind of like a substitution effect. Um, basically, if Americans desire for foreign goods changes, that would affect supply. Okay, and this would only be true if the foreign country is the other currency we're thinking about. Okay, so for example, um, let's say that Americans really want Italian food. Well, that would drive up the demand for specifically foreign goods for the other currency. Okay, um, so what this would do is it would cause supply of dollars to increase. Supply of dollars would increase in this case. Okay, on the other hand, if we decide we're going to boycott German items for some reason, then less money would go to Germany, so you get a reduction in supply of U.S. dollars. So that's one thing that can affect it. Another is wealth. So the wealth of U.S. citizens, also important. If U.S. wealth goes up, that means the supply of U.S. dollars is going to increase. More wealth, more purchasing, more supply of dollars uh, leaving the United States. Um, if you want to kind of give these secondary names, you can kind of think of this as like a substitution effect. And this is kind of like an income effect to tie that into your microeconomic lessons. So this is thinking about the types of goods people are buying. They're changing their, their choices. This is just thinking about how their wealth goes up. They buy more of everything. Okay. Um, also, we can think about investments. Changes in the perceived value of foreign investments. So, for example, if the expected return of German bonds goes up, then the supply of U.S. dollars goes up. Okay, German bonds are expected to perform well. If they're expected to give high real interest rates, then people are going to buy more German bonds. Um, and as a result, they're going to have to supply more U.S. dollars to purchase those German bonds. And this is really thinking about it in terms of real interest rate. That's what we're talking about here. When we say value, we're talking real interest rate. So the investors would do the you know, calculations for inflation and make those adjustments as they see fit. So thinking about buying different goods, thinking about wealth, thinking about buying different investments, all of these things matter. Um, a fourth one, similar to number three, change in riskiness. foreign investments. If German bonds become riskier, people will buy less German bonds and thus you'll have a reduction in supply. This seems like a good time to go ahead and mention too that these effects are not just for the foreign. These also can be relevant for U.S. investment options. Okay, So also, if the U.S. stock market is expected to be very volatile, I could add this as another category. The book actually didn't do this for some reason, okay? But what you need to recognize here is this can have the same effect. The effect would be smaller, but it could have the same effect. So, for example, one reason I might buy German bonds is because I think they're going to perform well. Another reason why I might buy German bonds is because I think they're less risky. A third reason why I might buy German bonds is because I don't want to buy U.S. stocks or I don't want to buy U.S. bonds. So that's also a relevant thing. So you can think of the return and risk of these foreign investments relative to the risk and return of domestic investments, okay? These effects would be bigger, which is probably why the book thought about it here. Um, this would be smaller. The reason this would be smaller is if the U.S. stock market is expected to be more volatile, U.S. investors would buy you know, investments from all over the world, not just Germany or Italy, okay? Nonetheless, that absolutely still does matter. If U.S. investors think the stock market is going to perform worse, 
then money is going to flood into the European investment market. So we've got four so far, two more. Five gets into expectations. The expectation of appreciation or depreciation can also matter. This goes to show that the efficient market hypothesis is gonna be somewhat valid in exchange markets, okay? Um, because this is a market people speculate in. There are currency traders, right? There are foreign exchange traders, Forex traders, you probably heard them referred to as. Um, there's a lot of people who do this professionally. And so basically what that means is um, foreign exchange markets are forward looking. So not only do these four things matter, but also expectations of those occurring can matter. So if you're in this market, if you think German bonds are eventually going to become safer, then you know that people are going to be supplying more U.S. dollars in the future, which would depreciate U.S. dollars. So you could trade ahead of that. You could trade in anticipation of that happening. So if you think the U.S. dollar is going to depreciate, you would want to get rid of U.S. dollars today, which will indeed cause it to depreciate. All right. This is very similar to what we saw in the U.S. stock market. If you think Amazon stock is eventually going to go down in value, well, you would do things now to make it go down. You would short it or you would sell it, which would drive down the price. So the expectation of future events can influence the, the, the current reality. Okay. And then last one here. This one's also not in the book, but I think it's uh, relevant and definitely relevant in 2021. Um, changes in law. Specifically, if you think about immigration laws or trading laws like tariffs, those can definitely be relevant. Um, so, for example, if we uh, put an increased tariff on French wines, that would reduce the amount of money that's leaving the U.S., right? To get French wine, you got to exchange U.S. dollars. But if you're not buying the French wines because the tariff is driving up the price, the supply of U.S. dollars exiting the market goes down, okay? So these are all the things that matter for supply. These are also all the things that matter for demand if you flip it around, okay? So the thing that affects supply, let's start at the very, uh, no, let's start right here. I think this is an easy one to think about, number two. American wealth affects the supply of U.S. dollars, okay? Now, what affects the demand for U.S. dollars? European wealth, okay? If Americans' wealth go up, we exchange more dollars, right? We put more money into the foreign exchange market. On the other hand, if European wealth goes up, then they will want to buy more U.S. goods, which means that they're going to demand more U.S. dollars. So the things that affect supply affect demand from the other side of the market, okay? To, to summarize that, into something that uh, hopefully will make sense is to make this realization. The supply of US dollars is the demand for euros. Those are one in the same. Okay, so the things that affect supply are the same things that affect demand. You just got to make sure you're keeping your markets straight. All right, from the Eurozone, the demand for Euros is the supply of US dollars. You see, those are really telling us the same thing. So what we know is, you know, I just went through those lists of six things that affect the supply of U.S. dollars. Those are also the things that you need to know for demand. So those six things are really the only six factors we're going to pay attention to. You could probably come up with some others to add to that list, but those six are the big ones. Those are the ones that we probably care the most about, okay? So just to give you an example, let me wrap this up here. This is what it's going to look like on the uh, quiz or exam. I'm going to have to be uh, creative when I ask these questions. But um, 
suppose that the U.S. stock market is expected to become riskier. And then I would ask you to show this, how it would affect the U.S. dollar market and also how it would affect the euro market, all right? So we're going to draw two graphs. So this is going to be the quantity of euros. This will be the quantity of U.S. dollars. This is the euros per dollar. It's just the price, okay? But what we're saying here is the price is for... What we're saying is how much does a dollar cost? Okay, that's what we're saying there for price. And here, we're flipping that. We're asking how much does a euro cost? And then we've got the supply and we've got the demand. Okay, so that's our starting point right there. It takes quite a while just to get to the point where we can answer this question. Our question asks, suppose that the U.S. stock market is expected to become riskier. We can think about this in the U.S. We can think about it in the uh, European area here. Um, let's start with the U.S., okay? If the U.S. stock market is expected to become riskier, as a U.S. citizen, how would that affect your supply? Or would it at all? Well, if you expect the U.S. stock market to be riskier, what that means is you probably don't want to invest in the U.S. stock market. So you might look for other places you can invest your money. And Europe is a viable option. So you're going to see an increase in supply. More money is leaving the U.S. market, okay, going into the foreign exchange. The reason for this is I'm an investor. I decide I would like to invest in German stocks, okay? And as I buy German stocks, I've got to take my dollars and exchange them for euros. So you get a supply increase here. Since I'm supplying dollars, I'm demanding euros. The first thing I'm gonna do if I'm gonna buy European investments is take my dollars and turn them into to, uh, euros. Again, I might not literally do that, but the financial markets will. So if I go into like Ameritrade, TD Ameritrade, and I say I'm gonna buy some stock from a company in Germany, my money's gonna get exchanged before it actually buys that stock. So I supply dollars to demand euros. But it turns out that's not the only effect, okay? The other effect is, and we can think about it here from the European standpoint, if you're in the Eurozone, you don't want to buy American investments anymore. So you may have been about to buy American investments, but you decide not to. Or you sell American investments and take your money out. Either way, the supply decreases here. Less European money is going to come to the U.S. to get exchanged. Conversely, if you're not supplying those funds, you're not demanding the dollars. So demand is going to drop. And so the overall result is the price in this market goes up. The price in this market goes down. To put it another way, the euro appreciates, the U.S. dollar depreciates. And as we've seen in the past, we can't definitely, we can't, we can't for sure know what's happening to quantity, right? It's like an ambiguous effect. Um, so by doing this, we can think about what drives um, exchange rates in the short run. And exchange rates are really important. Exchange rates affect a lot of different things, okay? And we'll see more of that as we move into the future. Or if you've seen international trade, you know that this is the case. Um, so if the U.S. dollar is depreciating, that will change a lot of different stuff. One thing it will do is it will make um, perhaps more people move to the U.S., right? If the U.S. dollar is losing value, that means you can exchange more of your euros for US dollars. So if you give this some time, think about how this might affect things in the long run, you might expect people to move to the US to take advantage of the lowered US dollar, okay? Um, so there's one example, uh, kind of the same deal with the earlier material in this unit. Um, I could go through tons of different examples here, but I don't think that's the best use of your time. The best thing is for you to practice it. So make sure you're working through that worksheet.